Mind the gap. What does that mean to me? In a way, my whole life has been lived in the gap. I have a physical disability called osteogenesis imperfecta, or brittle bones disease. And before I was born, I broke 30 to 40 bones in utero, and they healed in the womb, and so my arms and legs have been bent since I was born. I use an electric wheelchair. I got my first wheelchair when I was two and a half years old, and I destroyed a lot of doorways and also ran over a lot of people's feet when I was first learning how to drive. Um, and my disability has obviously shaped a lot about my life, and I've had to fight a lot of battles on the fringes to get equal access and to participate in society fully. Luckily, I have very supportive parents, and so when I would come up with ideas of what I wanted to try to do next, they would encourage me, and they didn't hold me back. So when I was 10 years old, I told them that I wanted to join orchestra, and instead of trying to discourage me because of my small size, they just said that they were sure I'd be able to figure it out. So with the help of an encouraging music teacher, we figured out that I could play the violin up and down like a tiny cello rather than on my shoulder because it was way too big for me to do that. I played violin all the way through high school and continued to do so after while in college. In 2006, I joined my first band. In 2011, I wrote my first original song. And in 2016, I won NPR Music's Tiny Desk Contest. Now I am a full-time touring musician, and I am lucky to have my husband come along with me. I still consider myself to be an advocate for people with disabilities because as a musician with a disability, I'm realizing that access for performers is extremely limited and that I can use my voice publicly to help raise some awareness of the issues that still face people with disabilities. However, living with a disability may put you in a gap in terms of accessibility, but it's not actually the area where I feel the gap the most. If you were to ask me what the biggest gap has been so far in my life, I would actually say sexuality. And although it might seem kind of surprising, I know I'm not alone. Research shows that sex has often been rated as one of the areas of greatest oppression for people with disabilities. So what have I learned from my life in the gap? And how can you benefit from my experiences? And what can you take away today? Before I begin, I just want to start with a disclaimer that I'm only one person with a disability. And there are so many different experiences that I would not want to generalize any statements about sexuality and disability in for the rest of the population. There's also a lot of sexual abuse for people with disabilities. I think the number is somewhere around 70% of people with disabilities experience sexual abuse, and I have never been abused. So I'm coming from a very specific time and place. I am a white, heterosexual female. I'm 32 years old, so I can only offer you my perspective in hope to share what I've learned, but you will have to remain open-minded to all the other perspectives of disability that are out there. Now let's go ahead and identify the gap. What I mean by the gap is that people with disabilities are essentially left out of the sex and beauty culture that is so prevalent in American society. And this is not a small omission. 19% of Americans identify as having some sort of disability. That's almost one in five people. But people with disabilities are almost never portrayed in the media at all, and especially not as a love interest, a beautiful person, or as a, like a sexual interest in any kind of plots or advertisements. Anything that you've seen in the last year, there's no way that it's been 19% has been depicted as someone with a disability. Um, there are reasons for this omission, and a big one that I believe the reason that people with disabilities are left out of the sex and beauty culture is because that the U.S. has actually a very extensive history of viewing people with disabilities as unfit to breed. There were actually eugenics programs that were legal in 33 states in the United States, and some were as late as 1956. 
people were labeled as defectives and sterilized forcibly. And actually, this still occurs today for some people with mental and psychiatric disabilities. So sexual freedom for people with disabilities has long been negated. I would argue that this history, although we don't as commonly practice these um, terrible things anymore, I would argue that the history does still affect our national psychology. Um, there are lots of untrue beliefs that persist today about people with disabilities regarding sexuality. The biggest one is just that people with disabilities can't have sex, especially people with physical disabilities. Another untrue belief is that people with physical disabilities and other mental disabilities are eternal children because they need extra care and so they can never really be independent or care for another person. Um, the other and maybe one of the most damaging is just that you're seen as asexual, that you have no sex drive. So largely ignored in the public is the sexual needs and growth of people with disabilities. I personally felt left out of the sex and beauty culture in, as a pretty young child. In fifth grade, we had our first school dance and I eagerly awaited being asked by a boy and of course nobody asked me. So I took matters into my own hands because that's how I am. And unfortunately, after a lot of hemming and hawing, the boy I asked said no, that he thought we were just friends so he couldn't say yes to go to the dance with me. Well, this just friends clause followed me around for the next 12 years. Every time I felt that maybe somebody I had feelings for felt the same way, we would talk about it and it would turn out they were just friends. Now, whether or not this is actually true, which it could be, we were really big nerds and not a lot of my friends were dating at the time. So it's not very scientific. However, whether or not none of these people felt that way or that some people just couldn't admit to themselves, that they had feelings for someone with a pretty visible disability is up for debate, and I'll probably never actually know the truth behind all of that. The other thing that was hard, and that was really sad for me, I mean, I spent a lot of time feeling pretty bummed about the situation of my sexuality as a teenager especially. The other thing that was hard is that when you are a girl with bendy arms, there is virtually nobody depicting your body type as beautiful. In America, usually when you think of what is beautiful, we generally define it as tall and blonde and busty and thin. And in reality, very few people meet this um, supposed ideal. However, I was actually anything but that ideal. I was completely the opposite. So I did feel very left out. And I didn't fit the standard of beauty and I worried because of this that no one would ever love me or want to get married, which is something that I very much wanted to do. It turns out that my beliefs were not completely unfounded. In the American Community Survey from 2008 to 2012, if you extrapolate the data, it shows that people with disabilities are only 48% or they are 48% less likely to marry than people without disabilities. So there is a big disparity between people marrying with disabilities and without. And so there's quite a few people don't marry with disabilities. So that's something I worried about a lot. Luckily, I had awesome parents and they helped me to cope with the state of being single as a young adult. Um, they both had different ways to approach. So my mom, or my dad, I should say first, my dad's piece of advice to me was that all boys are idiots till they're at least 25. So I, I was in high school, I had a few years to prove him wrong, so I felt that that helped a little bit to be like, okay, I just gotta wait it out, eventually they'll become smarter. But my mom took a little different avenue and she said that two of her best friends were women that did not get married until they were in their 40s for the first time. And she said instead of moping about being single and feeling like they weren't successful, what they did is they just went out and had a lot of really interesting experiences. They pursued a lot of their passions. They were really unique individuals. So by the time they did meet the people they would eventually marry, they were some of the most interesting people around. And one of the reasons their partners fell in love with them is for their depth. This helped me a lot, actually. It, it's not that I only did things that would maybe someday lead to a cool story I could tell to a boy, but 
I did end up getting very involved as a young adult, and I did a lot of really fun things. I worked on an organic farm. I worked for a disability rights organization. I got involved in politics. I played a lot of music, and it helped to kind of take the focus off of the fact that I wasn't dating, and it really did help me to feel more empowered. So that was a really good piece of advice from my mom. Um, I was pretty confident in my own self-worth, and luckily I never developed a hatred of my own body. However, I did still have a lingering doubt that I would ever find love. So in the fourth year of college, I would like to say my senior year, but it was not. Um, <laughs> My fourth year of college, I had a, basically a mind-blowing epiphany. I was writing a paper for a class called Political Theory, and I had read a book called Eros and Civilization by a theorist named Marcuse, Herbert Marcuse. And he had, and Eros, in he described in the book, was basically sexual desire, sexual energy. Sometimes he would use it to explain even like creativity. So it was kind of a broad term. So he had said that sexuality had been usurped by capitalism. And what, what he meant by that really is that people were fed these images by the media, by companies, by marketing, by the, the news, everything that they were taking in is that the standards of beauty and sexuality were essentially unattainable. Very, very, very limited number of people could even fall in these categories. And the reason, and this was not an innocent mistake, he argued that the reason society set such high and unrealistic standards for beauty is so that people would feel bad about themselves and then buy things to fix themselves. And you have to admit, the theorists were probably onto something because we have a huge industry of cosmetics, of clothing, of weight loss programs, of um, any kind of makeup that you can think of. We have a lot of money pouring in because people feel insecure about their bodies and they want to fix them, right? And deep down, what people believe when they are purchasing these products is they're buying into the lie that if I just lose those last 10 pounds, if I just get the right clothes, I might too be beautiful. Now, I had all along known, and this is kind of when the epiphany started, I all along had known as a very young child that I did not fit the mold of beautiful and that no amount of makeup would cover up my bendy arms and no cool clothes would cover up the fact that I used a wheelchair. I just felt that the standards did not apply to me. And I felt a lot of sadness about that as a younger person. But this day that I was reading Marcuse, it dawned on me, a lightning bolt struck my brain that I had been free all along and I hadn't recognized my own freedom. Now, of course, I was invisible in terms of what society talks about when they say sexuality and beauty, but being invisible, I realized, was far superior to being scrutinized. Once I realized that the standards didn't apply to me, weight, hair, clothes, makeup, it's not like I spent a lot of time on those anyways at this point, because, again, I felt I wasn't really what would be the point of trying to go after these things, but I, I realized how much time other people had to spend on these things because they were chasing an ideal they thought they might be able to obtain. So by being free, I was able to change a lot of my own internal perspectives. I, was, I still cared about how I looked, of course. I didn't stop showering or anything. But I did let go of a few things that I didn't care about personally, and I realized since these standards are all fabricated, I can choose which things I want to adhere to. So I stopped shaving my legs because I am lazy and I hate shaving my legs and I don't think women should have to because men don't have to. And I also stopped wearing shoes because I do have feet, but I've obviously never walked a day in my life and I was like, why do I spend money on something that's uncomfortable and I, they're not functional in any way? So I stopped wearing shoes. Instead, I kind of shifted my energy in terms of things that I actually did feel good about. So I like wearing bright colored dresses, and I like sparkly jewelry, and I really like purses. And so 
I, I kind of focused things that I did enjoy and that did make me feel more beautiful. And if you focus on what makes you feel good, you do feel more attractive, just like naturally, the way you move in society. But it was a lot more than just external appearances that changed when I realized that I was free from societal standards. I realized that I was also free to pursue love in a way that didn't matter what society thought of me. So shortly after, and I do believe it was because of the shift that I had, I ended up having my first romantic relationship. Um, a friend of mine, a wonderful man that we've been friends for a long time, he's now with another wonderful man, so we are not together. But at the time, um, we had a really sweet relationship and a lot of my confidence all of a sudden came out of the fact that I realized that I, I was okay and I didn't need to worry about what society thought and I was more confident and able to pursue a relationship. After that person came out of the closet, we obviously didn't continue to date, so we, I, I was single again, but I was much more empowered at this point in my life. I felt a lot more whole. And so a few months later, I met who would later become my husband. And Paul is a wonderful person. Um, oh, that's me in my pretty clothes. There, there's Paul. So Paul is a wonderful person, but when we first started dating, we had to have a lot of honest discussions about you know, how he felt about all these standards too, because there is some judgment that came at him and we had predicted that it would. Um, by dating someone with a disability, if you yourself do not have a disability. Some people misunderstood our relationship and they felt that maybe he was being my caretaker instead of a partner. And so he had to decide if he was ready to accept the challenges that came with dating someone in a wheelchair. And so ultimately he and I decided that if people were going to judge him or me for being in a relationship together, that they weren't really our friends anyways. So we did decide to go ahead and date. And we dated for seven years. Um, we had a lot of fun. We've done a lot of awesome things together. And people in time did come to accept our relationship. Even those that were hesitant at the beginning did begin to realize that we have the same basis of love and friendship and respect and laughter that any other couple has and our relationship is just as valid. And so people came around and we got married um, three years ago almost now. And the thing that I still believe and I, I think that the freedom from these standards has helped me to really embrace is that people won't realize something is normal until they see it. When people got to know us, when people got to be close to us, that's when they really had to reevaluate their own assumptions. And so that is how we became um, more self-confident in our relationship. And we have a very authentic bond because of the fact that we know we can't compare ourselves to other couples our age, but instead we focus on each other and just being really open with each other. Um, freedom from society standards also gave me confidence that I am okay as myself. Like that standards are really just imposed on us by society. Beauty standards were the first one I noticed, but then I started to realize that all standards are ultimately in positions. And so if you are trying your best to be a good person, it's okay to go against the grain. I think that is why I've been so willing and excited about following my dream. I have done a lot of things that scare me. I perform my own songs. I left a job in insurance to teach fiddle lessons and that was a pretty scary change but I knew it aligned with what I wanted to do with my life. And then when I won the tiny desk contest, my husband and I, armed with the freedom from society standards, decided we would sell our house and tour the country in our van. And that is why we are here now, is because together we're on this big adventure. Um, and so what does all of this have to do with you? I would like to argue that I have learned that if you already live in the gap, you realize you might as well live big. If nobody has any expectations of you, just do what you want. But this does not just apply to me. So what I want to leave you with today is that you also are free. You are free to 
be beautiful in the way that feels beautiful to you. You are free to pursue your dreams. You're, pers you're free to love who you want to love. And once you realize that you're free, you can start you know, pursuing interests that are big passions of yours. You can start building relationships that really suit you. You can really do anything. And so I would like to ask you to maybe reflect in the next couple of days of how you respond to societal pressures, not just regarding sexuality and beauty, but in all other ways of fitting in. You might have to make some changes to begin to live more authentically. You might have to leave some relationships that are unhealthy. You might have to redefine your boundaries. You might have to go to counseling. You might have to start creating art in a new way. Maybe all you need to do is just get a haircut that you really like that everybody thought would be weird. So, but as you leave here today, I want to remind you that you are beautiful and deserving of love. Even if society makes you feel invisible, you matter. Regardless of race, ability, gender, economic background, you matter. And so your task right now is not to fit in. Your task is to live authentically with love. And if I wish for you that you can live from a place of courage and conviction in your full personhood so that you, too, can inspire others to be who they really are. Thank you.